Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Pleasure to be on. Now let's continue our discussion of interfaith marriage. Last time we looked at the different verses of the Quran, what the Quran actually says about interfaith marriage. And now I want to look at how we understand those verses, and particularly how it concerns women, because it seems like women and men are given different rules within the Quran, especially as it pertains to marrying people like Jews and Christians. So can you explain, Dr. Shabir, why that differentiation seems to exist within the Quran? Yeah, so just to sum up our previous discussion, Safiya, we looked at Surah 2, verse 221, which actually speaks both ways, both uh, about men and women. Muslim men and Muslim women are not allowed to marry uh, polytheists. Uh, then we saw that uh, the, in the 60th chapter of the Quran, the 10th verse, there was a specific uh, mention about women, uh, whether they could be returned to the polytheistic community after they had migrated under difficult uh, circumstances. And the answer there was that once they have been shown to be uh, sincere believers and they're pledging themselves to abide by the rules of the new community, then they should be allowed to stay and they should not be returned to the polytheists. Um, this verse may not have anything to do with marriage per se, but even if it refers to actual marriage, uh, saying that the women are not permissible for the polytheists, uh, it uh, would not uh, go uh, differently from what we have already found from the verse that we first discussed. Surah 2 verse 221, saying that Muslim men and women are not allowed to marry outside of the community. The verse that leads to your question is Surah 5, verse number 5, which says that uh, Muslim men uh, are allowed to marry women from among the people of the book. And we understand people of the book to most commonly be represented uh, in the Jewish and Christian communities. So the question naturally arises from this, if men are allowed to marry from among the people of the book, why wouldn't uh, Muslim women be allowed to marry, let's say, a Jewish or a Christian man? Mm -hmm. And I think that's your question. Yes, yeah. yes. So, and of course, the verse doesn't explicitly say that Muslim women are not, are, are not allowed to marry. Um, Jews or Christians, right? Yes, the, the, the verse doesn't say either way mm -hmm. about whether women... It doesn't women, mention them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is uh, a silent... Uh, uh, the, the answer to, to it is not given. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are Muslim women allowed to marry a Jewish uh, or, or a Christian man? And uh, the answer is not given in the Quran. But Muslim scholars have uh, uh, tried to uh, derive a ruling about this. Of course, their, their uh, derived rulings, we should be aware, uh, are uh, derived not only only from the Quran, but it's the whole life experience and, and their, their entire, um, their upbringing, their social circumstances and so on. So they're Societal giving rulings. Context, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. They lived in a certain milieu in which certain things come naturally, certain things seem naturally abhorrent, and uh, they give their interpretations based on all of these factors. Sometimes they, they're conscious of their, uh, the, the, the fact that they're sons of their own times, and sometimes they're not. And, uh, and, and we have to be conscious that, that we ourselves are influenced by our own course, social yeah. context and so too were, were they. Uh, and now the question for us is that, uh, you know, are, are we bound by the previous social contexts uh, or uh, can Muslims uh, interpret their faith uh, in a responsible manner uh, with, with all of the scholarly apparatuses that uh, uh, ancient scholars have used, uh, but also add to that the changing and, and modern context. So uh, looking at the uh, context and so on, we see that the the Muslim scholars in the past have almost unanimously said uh, that a woman is a Muslim woman is not allowed to marry outside of the faith period. So they, they, the way they, they would reason it is that uh, permission is given specifically to the men to marry uh, from the people of the book, but such permission is not mentioned in the Quran for women, and therefore women have no such permission. Mm -hmm. uh, one can come back at this and say, but wait, logically, uh, the, things are generally said to be permissible unless there is a ruling against it. So if we don't have a ruling against a woman marrying a, a Jewish or Christian person, uh, then uh, that should basically by default be permissible. There is a specific ruling against a woman marrying a polytheistic person. Uh, and, and some people may want to say, well, well, wait a minute, Jews and Christians may be polytheists as well. But uh, no, clearly Jews are monotheists. And uh, there 
is some question from a Muslim standpoint about the monotheism that Christians espouse. But uh, to be sure, Christians insist that there is only one God. And despite their belief uh, in, in that monotheism that they profess, uh, being different from the monotheism that Muslims uh, profess. Uh, nonetheless, in, in the Quran itself, Christians are not referred to by the title mushrikun or polytheists. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the term mushrikun, meaning polytheists in the Quran, almost invariably uh, refers to the pagans of Arabia. Christians, by a distinction, are referred to as people of the book. Mm -hmm. So too are, are Jews. Uh, it is a respectful title. And uh, while the Quran uh, says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ Those who say God is a third of three have disbelieved. And uh, it, it, it also said, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ Those who say Jesus, uh, uh, the son of Mary, uh, or those who say God is is Jesus, son of Mary, have disbelieved. So even though the Quran uh, is uh, giving against uh, some known Christian beliefs at the time, the Quran nonetheless uh, does not refer to uh, the believing Christian community at that time uh, by the title kuffar, as you know, the kuffar refers to the rejectors of the uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, as a title, and it does not refer to them as mushrikun, as polytheists. So when the Quran is saying, "Do not marry the polytheists," it's uh, the the idea of Jews and Christians uh, is not really in vogue here. It's uh, the the target is the polytheists of Arabia. Mm -hmm. so, we so, let's, so let's get back to the question of women now. So mm -hmm. why weren't, what reasoning could there be for women not being included within that verse? So logically, as I've said, there, there is no reason for thinking that the verse means that women cannot marry uh, outside okay. uh, of the faith, meaning that women cannot marry uh, Jews and Christians in, in particular. There's nothing in the verse that says that. And there is only an argument from silence uh, that has been advanced by our classical Muslim scholars uh, who have said, OK, the verse says that men can marry uh, Jews and Christians, but it does not say that women could marry and therefore women could not marry. So they have drawn an inference, uh, inference from the silence of the Quran, but that inference is probably shaped more by their cultural and social circumstances and the milieu in which they lived. And we can understand uh, why, why that social milieu prevailed. In, in ancient societies, women did not have the kinds of power that they have now, and, and they did not have the state protection that they have now. Uh, so we can well imagine that uh, in, you know, up to a, a few hundred years ago, uh, if a Muslim woman married outside of the faith, let's say a Muslim woman were married to a Christian man, and uh, it, she may find it difficult to uh, stand her ground and retain her faith in those circumstances. And now, in many traditional societies, religion was uh, uh, said to follow from the religion of the father. Mm -hmm. So if if uh, they, they had a child, then naturally the child will be assumed uh, to be of the religion of uh, his or her father. Uh, so it is viewed in the Muslim context. A uh, child born in a marriage takes on naturally the religion of the father. So when a Muslim man is permitted to marry a Jewish or a Christian lady, it is presumed in the Islamic context that any child born of that ma marriage will be a Muslim, following from the religion of the father. And uh, while it is uh, presume that the Muslim man is obligated to assist his wife in carrying out all of her religious duties and practices, even though she be a Jew or a Christian, to the extent that she, he might need to drive her to church. And that's fine. Uh, he, he's not doing anything Islamic. He's actually doing the Islamic thing by assisting his wife to retain her religious uh, consciousness and, and her practices. Now, Muslim scholars could not see the same guarantee being offered from the other direction because Muslim scholars insisted our faith says that a Muslim man has to uh, ensure the uh, religiosity of his uh, wife, though she be, be of a different religion. Uh, but we cannot guarantee that this will, same privilege will be offered to a Muslim woman if she were to marry a person outside of the faith. Mm -hmm. so, so given all that you're saying, then can't, can't someone, you know, an observer say, well, then in that sense that verse makes sense that it doesn't include women you know because women probably were not marrying outside of the faith at the time of the prophet 
Yes, that would be an interesting point to make. And of course, it wouldn't change uh, the, uh, the logic of what I said already, mm -hmm. that uh, if the verse does not by itself prohibit uh, women from marrying outside of the faith, we can say that there is nothing specifically in the verse itself. Now, we might ask about the common sense uh, of the issue as well. And I think this is a very important uh, uh, point. Whereas uh, we have said that the, the verse permits men to marry uh, Jewish and Christian women, uh, some uh, Muslim scholars have said that this applies only where Islam is the prevailing culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go to a different situation where it seems that, uh, you know, the children born in a marriage might more likely follow the uh, religion of the mother, who happens to be a Jewish or Christian lady, then from the Islamic point of view, this is objectionable because we are losing a progeny to another faith. And um, and, and so they, they rule that this is impermissible. And in fact, it is noted that Omar an, the second caliph of Islam, had noticed that a lot of Muslim men were marrying outside of the religion. And uh, he said that this has got to stop because if men continue like this, who's going to marry the Muslim women? That's interesting. And, I didn't yes. know that. Yeah. And so he, he, he deemed it, uh, he, he, he objected to that. And following his ruling, some have said that it is makru, Muslim scholars to this day, uh, following that ruling, say that it is makru or objectionable uh, for a Muslim man to marry a Jewish or Christian woman, even though the explicit permission was there in the Quran, but they will give justifications for that. Uh, but uh, the justification of Omar was that we can't continue like, like this. Mm -hmm. And um, now in, in a modern context, uh, we can see that many things have changed. One is that women have actually been given a lot of power and a lot of state protection. So often if there is a dissolution of a marriage, uh, the children will actually go uh, into the care of the mother and uh, the mother will then have a large uh, influence on the upbringing of the children. Moreover, if a woman is married uh, even to a non-Muslim man, uh, she uh, is protected by state rules uh, to, uh, to make sure that she cannot be forced away from her marriage and she has uh, away from her religion and she has uh, every full right to exercise her religious conscience uh, within a marriage. And, uh, and and men, you know, uh, are, are are not given the kind of uh, free hand that they had in in traditional times. Uh, so. That changes the dynamic a little bit. Uh, um, I mean, there are still things that go on be behind locked doors that uh, the state may not know about. Women may still be coerced into situations and so on. Uh, but but there is there is definitely a change in in this regard. Mm -hmm. So with these changes in mind, one would naturally ask, uh, you know, why should the woman be permitted to mm -hmm. marry outside of the faith? But I wanted to say something about the practical side of this. Uh, Khalid Abu al Fadl is a known uh, Muslim scholar who has been well trained in traditional Islamic sciences. And at the same time, he lives in the modern context. He lives in the United States of America, and he has written many books and articles. His, uh, uh, many of his articles are found on his website, scholarofthehouse.com. And there he's addressed this question about women marrying outside of the faith. And he says that uh, after 20 or 30 years of being with the Muslim community and seeing the results of interfaith marriages, He's not recommending it uh, from the practical, practical point of view. In fact, he thinks that it, uh, you know, he, it should be dissuaded. Uh, people should be dissuaded from doing this because what he finds is that when children grow up in, in these interfaith marriages, uh, they are not moored in, in uh, either the, the Muslim faith or the other faith. They try to uh, steer a neutral course between mom and dad and the two religions that are represented in the marriage. And they find themselves uh, uh, to be agnostic, uh, they don't know what to believe, and uh, you know this is not good for the faith of the uh, coming generation. So he dissuades people from marrying outside of three, both both men and women. And here we should ex ex we should uh, express the fairness, not by saying that okay, because men are permitted to marry outside, therefore women should also be permitted. Probably we should express the fair fairness by saying um, that uh, since. 
uh, we see in our present context that uh, the results of the interfaith marriages are such that the children are left uh, without a conviction in either faith, uh, that it is uh, better, much better, uh, for both men and women to restrict themselves to marrying within the faith. Not, not because there is a restriction from God, but because practically you can see that this is not what you want for the future generations of Muslims. Mm -hmm. Unexpected conclusion. Thank you for that, <laughs> that Dr. Shabir. Any welcome. last thoughts you want to uh, share before we end this uh, segment? Well, if there's uh, time for a last thought, what I would say is that uh, in, uh, another consideration that Khalid Abdul al-Fadl uh, pointed out, pointed uh, to, and, and I should also mention here as a side note that uh, there is a website, understanding-islam.com, in which similar answers are given as well. Uh, but, but now sticking to what uh, Khalid Abdul al-Fadl said, uh, you know, the, the people have to evaluate for themselves and we can't evaluate for them. How important are the religious considerations? Like here we are saying, okay, what, what about your children? Are your children going to be Muslim or not? But somebody may be yeah. saying, well, I don't people really care. Like, you know, yes. you know, and, and, and some people, uh, with, with no offense, like some people are, are very strictly Muslims and then some people are almost nominal Muslims. And mm -hmm. some will say that, you know, uh, by themselves, you know, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, I, I remember one of my professors saying that, yes, I'm a Muslim, but if you probe me, you won't find much there. Um, you know, so, 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 you know, people are at various levels and the different spectrum. And, and you could marry someone who's Muslim who doesn't practice at all, right? A, exactly. a, a practicing Muslim could marry someone who doesn't really practice Islam, who might be worse than somebody who is not a Muslim, but respects the fact that they are practicing their faith. Exactly, and, and, and may cooperate with you in practicing mm -hmm. your faith and, and all of that. And, uh, you know, a Muslim woman may say, look, I, I am a Muslim, I come from a Muslim family, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't have much to do with the religion. And uh, why should the religion restrict me from marrying outside? I love this uh, guy. He's not a Muslim, but he's a good person. Uh, what, what, you know, they, they would find it incomprehensible mm -hmm. that there is some kind of like as a hammer coming down on them uh, at an unexpected moment, like where does this come from? Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if one is not following other rules, uh, then why this rule? And, and the rule might be imposed by parents and, and, and family and so on, the social context in which people live. Uh, and, but, so we don't want to say that the, the religion should be incomprehensible. We want to say, all right, I mean, as Khalil Abdel Fadl is saying, you weigh it for yourself. You be your own judge as to you know what's good for you and what's good for your uh, children. We leave it at that, Dr. Okay. Thank all you right. for your time. You're welcome. If you enjoyed this video, click like and subscribe. And please donate to support our work at QuranSpeaks.com.